All right, so we're going to talk about um, randomness. Maybe, if I can get the slide to move. All right. Um, what is it about chance outcomes being random that makes random selection seem fair? There are two things. Nobody can guess the outcome before it happens. And when we want things to be fair, usually there's some underlying set of outcomes uh, that will be equally likely. All right, so like when you roll a die. Now, I'm going to use some terminology you may not be used to. We always say dice because usually you have at least more than one. Usually you have two. But the single term for dice is die. So when I roll a die, I'm equally likely to get a one or a two or a three. I've got a one in six chance to get any one of the numbers from one to six. So when we talk about fair, Mr. Adams will say fair, it means I have an equal probability of any of the outcomes. Heads or tails on a coin. If the coin is a fair coin, I'm equally likely 50% chance I'll get heads, 50% chance I'll get tails. So if I flip a coin, does the outcome match your choice? Did you know before you flipped a coin whether or not it would match? You could say heads, but you really don't know. Statisticians don't think of randomness as an annoying tendency of things uh, to be unpredictable or haphazard. Statisticians use randomness as a tool. But truly random values are surprisingly hard to get. It's not easy to just randomly pick things. So. It's surprisingly difficult to generate random values even when they are likely, equally likely. Computers have become a popular way to generate random numbers. Uh, even though they often do much better than humans, computers can't generate truly random numbers either. So if you've ever done any coding, when you go to select a random numbers, there's, there's parameters. Um, and there's a couple different ways to select random numbers. Uh, but e e even computers aren't perfect for the randomness. Um, I think what they want, I, what the author is trying to tell us is, look, if I choose a number between 1 and 10 and I do it a 1,000 times, you would think that you'd have the same number of number 1s, the same number of number 2s, the same number of number 3s, so on and so forth. Well, if you let a computer do it, it won't be exactly the same. If human beings do it, it won't be exactly the same. If I have, if I create some sort of device, drawing cards, a ten-sided die, which they make, um, it won't be exactly even for all ten choices. And I think that's what they're saying. So then you would say, well, how random is it actually? Okay. So since computers follow programs, the random numbers we get from computers are pseudo-random. A lot of times it'll start with a number, do some math to that number, truncate some things, and then spit out an output value, but you're really doing math. Unfortunately, or fortunately, pseudo-random values are good enough for most purposes, okay? So there are, all, there are ways to generate random numbers uh, that they are both equally likely and truly random. So the best ways we know to generate data uh, that give a fair and accurate picture of the world rely on randomness. And the ways in which we draw conclusions from, the, from those data depend on the randomness too. Okay. So we need an imitation of the real process so we can manipulate or control it. In short, we're going to simulate reality. The sequence of events we want to investigate is called a trial. Um, building, the basic building block of simulation is um, called the component. Trials usually um, involve several components. After the trial, we record what happened and our response variable. Okay? Um, there are seven steps to a simulation. First, you've got to identify the component that you want to be repeated. Explain how you will model the component's outcome. Explain how you will combine the components to model the trial. State clearly what the response variable is, run the 
run several trials, collect the summaries, uh, collect the summary, blah, 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 collect and summarize uh, the results of the trials and state your conclusion. Now, I love this part of statistics because I want to, I'm, I'm going to share a quick story. When Mr. Adams was in college, obviously I'm a physics uh, major, and my lab partner, his name was Nick. Now, Nick's a really smart dude. Uh, I think he, if I remember correctly, he graduated from Cornell with his PhD in physics. Um, one day, Nick and I are sitting in the physics. Uh, they gave us an office, sort of. It wasn't really an office. It was a classroom that had desk in it, and all the physics majors would go and sit and do their work in there, right? So um, Nick and I were good friends, and we would always talk about stuff, laugh and joke, and hang out and stuff. But uh, Nick and I were sitting there one day, and uh, I don't remember how this came up in the conversation, but I said, Nick, you know what? I bet that if you play blackjack, right, there, and you just keep hitting the cards, the dealer has to hit the cards as well, and there's got to be a certain percentage uh, that you will win. In other words, the dealer will, will bust. And I, in my head, said, it's got to be like 15% of the time. So if you know anything about probabilities, if you know when that 15% is about to occur, then you bet a lot of money. So you can lose money, lose money, lose money, but if you bet a lot of money uh, when you think the dealer's gonna bust, then you'll win more money than you lose. And so this was just a random nerd conversation that two physics majors are having uh, in their free time. So I just said that randomly, didn't think anything of it. He comes in the next morning, he said, I ran a million simulations. It was, I can't remember the number, I think it was like 17% or 12%. So he wrote a program on his calculator. Well, that's what he did is he, he, he randomly chose which values represented certain cards and he used a calculator to do it and he ran a million simulators on a TI calculator like this. And it started a very long conversation. It, it lasted a while, but basically we developed the same card counting technique that was in the movie 21. And what was funny is uh, Nick, I remember Nick telling me, he's like, I got an idea. And I was like, what's that? And he was like, why don't we take pipes and run them into homes and then we can put water in the pipes and pipe the water into the houses and we could call it indoor plumbing because he was making fun of me because I invented something that already existed, but I didn't invent it, it was him. Anyways, so here's some things to be aware of. Don't overstate your case. Beware of confusing what really happens with what a simulation suggests might happen. Model outcome chances accurately. A common mistake in constructing a simulation is to adopt a strategy that may appear to produce the right kind of result. So I said 15, he came back with a number 17%. What if he came back with a number that was 5%? Should he go in and change the simulation to match my number? No, no. Um, run enough trials. Simulation is cheap and fairly easy to do. He ran a million trials. We had the conversation at like one o'clock in the afternoon when I saw him the next morning at 8 a.m. he had ran a million trials. So he was very confident in those numbers. How to harness the power of randomness. A simulation model can help us investigate uh, the question when we can't or don't want to collect data. And a mathematical answer is hard to calculate. How to base our simulation on random values generated by a computer, generated by a randomizing device, or found on the internet. Um, simulations can provide us with meaningful insights about the real world. I feel like I skipped something. Anyways, um, for sim simple simulations, uh, it's just easy to calculate. For example, we can simulate binomial distribution in chapter 16, but can calculate the theoretical probability more quickly. However, we can simulate complex procedures whose theoretical probability would be very difficult to calculate. So this one million trials that uh, my, my old lab partner ran, he had to figure out a way to write a program that would randomly select the cards without replacement. And, uh, you know, I think he did six decks. So you have to, 
assign a value and randomly choose these cards and then once the certain cards were drawn you have to toss them out um, when we learn about the chapter when we learn in chapter two that Gossett used simulations to discover discover a new distribution used for small samples um, I, I'm sorry we will learn in chapter 22 that Gossett used simulations to discover a new distribution uh, used for small samples. Statisticians use computer simulations to explore um, uh, complex scenarios. A computer can contain a large population and statisticians can see what happens in the population when the population is sampled under certain conditions. Um, for the AP exam, when discovering a simulation, be very specific about the, uh, the steps that need uh, that are needed to run it, be able to describe a simulation with technology, physical ob objects like numbers in a hat, or a random digit table. Uh, in your textbook, uh, which is online, there's a, a thing in the back of just random numbers. So you, you're supposed to, in theory, close your eyes and just put your finger down on the book and on the page, and uh, it'll randomly give you a number. So. Always take careful note about whether your simulation is taking place with or without replacement. So if you don't, uh, cards are a perfect example. If I, if I want to know what's the probability of pulling four kings, like let's say I'm playing poker, what's the probability of me getting all four kings? Well, the, to do the math on that, there's 52 cards in the deck. There's four kings in the deck. So the probability of my first card being drawn and being a king is four out of 52. But once I get the king, now there are only three kings left and only 49 king, or 49, or 40, 51 cards left. So the probability changes based on whether you replace it or not. If I put the king back in the deck, which is not the case, you wouldn't do it that way, then, it, then that's a different outcome. Marbles in a bag is a great one. If I have bl three marble, blue marbles in a bag and two red marbles in the bag, what's the probability of me drawing a blue one? Three times in a row. Well, that depends. If I pull out a marble and keep the marble, the number of blue marbles and red marbles will change as I slowly take them out of the bag. So the probability changes. So we need to determine, am I going to replace the marbles back in the bag? or am I going to keep them out? So with or without replacement changes the outcomes. Uh, and that's it for today. Real easy. Real easy.